Good afternoon, good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming to our STEM Superheroes webinar that's co-hosted by NanoHeat at Stanford and the Poets Center. Um, our first speaker for today is Andrea Wallace. She graduated from the University of Arkansas with her bachelor's in mechanical engineering in May of 2016, and she got her master's in electrical engineering in December of 2017. Throughout her master's, she was an active member of Poets, the Poets Center and she held multiple positions in the Student Leadership uh, Council, including the treasurer, president, and vice president later on. She also worked on the IAB funded research project. After graduating in 2019, she accepted a position at Northrop Grumman in Mission Systems in Baltimore. And her current role is within the Pathways Rotational Program as a mechanical engineer working in microelectronic packaging. So today, Andrew's gonna to be telling us about her um, career and the path that led her here. Uh, and so with that, I'm gonna give the mic away to Andrea. Okay, thank you. Just wanna make sure you can hear me, right? Okay, good. So um, as a child, I was, I guess I could start out. I was born in 1994. Um, so as a child, my dad was in the Air Force. He was a fuel tank mechanic. Um, on fighter pilots or fighter jets like F-16s. And then later on, they ended up getting A-10s, um, which is an artillery um, plane. But anyways, I just spent a lot of my time on base with him, um, either just you know having to go to work with him or um, events that they would have out at the base, like air shows and stuff. And it was one of my favorite pastimes to go and just spend the day there looking at all the planes. And I would um, sometimes have the opportunity to like get inside the planes, you know, see what my dad would do. And it just always interested me, you know, how, like, how does that work? Um, so that was kind of how my interest in engineering started. Um, initially, um, I, I really wanted to be an aerospace engineer and work for NASA. Um, it was one of like my, goals for a very long time to work at NASA. Um, but before I decided to go into engineering, you know, like when you start getting in like, well, I don't know how it is now, but when I was like in high school, they started really pushing us to figure out what we wanted to do. Um, and before I decided on engineering, I thought about marine biology because the ocean always interested me. I felt like there was a lot to learn there um, or be a veterinarian just because I love animals. Um, so two other like very different um, career paths, um, but ultimately I decided with engineering because I had um, I, I had went on a uh, like a tour at the University of Arkansas and they um, you know, talked about the different types of engineering they had and it just really like drew me in. Um, some other dreams that I had when I was really young, I was in gymnastics, competitive gymnastics. So um, I wanted to be an Olympic gymnast at one point. Um, I wanted to be a chef when my dad started teaching me how to cook and then also a personal trainer because I was in athletics my whole life. And so those are just a few things along the way that um, I had interests in. But ultimately, I had to make a decision on what I wanted to pursue in college and aerospace engineering wasn't really an option because I say that I could have went far, but I wanted to stay close to home. Um, and like I said, the University of Arkansas offered a variety of engineering disciplines. And so I was most interested in mechanical engineering. So that was the route that I pursue. Um, like Ariel mentioned, I graduated in 2016 with my bachelor's in mechanical engineering. I quickly uh, rolled into graduate school there. Um, I was working with Dr. Mantooth, who is a part of Poets. And um, if you guys know him at all, he's got his hand in a wide variety of different types of electronic research, um, one being extreme environment um, electronics. And that was what interested me most because I wanted to pursue my PhD in space and planetary sciences. So the first three years I was in grad school, I was really going after that PhD. Um, along the way, I kind of decided that maybe the PhD route wasn't for me. Um, and if you guys have questions about that, I will be more than happy to answer. But, um, you know, I was doing research in electronic packaging with Dr. Mantooth, kind of decided that um, the PhD wasn't the route for me. A lot of my education while I was in grad school was in electrical engineering. So I ended up coming out of grad school with a master's in electrical engineering, which ultimately led me to um, getting a job at Northrop Grumman. Um, where I went into the rotational program um, and I'm currently in my second rotation right now. 
Uh, my first one was in electrical engineering and now I'm in mechanical. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Great. And so that's kind of um, more like technical. Here's like a bunch of pictures and stuff. Um, of like my extracurricular activities, I guess I should say. Um, while I was, like I said, while I was in, while I was a child, I did gymnastics. Um, and then that kind of turned into competitive cheerleading when I got to high school, which then ultimately led to me being a cheerleader in college. Um, so I did that all through my undergraduate career. When I got into graduate school, I became involved in poets. And so you can see a few pictures down in the bottom middle and down on the bottom right where um, I was either participating in like, um, like outreach programs for younger children. I say younger children, K through 12. I, I loved going to the outreach events that poets would put on, I'm always presenting posters at conferences for my IAB projects. And then on the bottom right, that's me mentoring an REU student my last summer um, in grad school. So um, I really enjoyed poets. It, I feel like made a huge impact on my graduate um, career and um, just, you know, made it that much more enjoyable being able to do more than just my research. Graduated in 2019, started my job at Northrop Grumman in, this, in January of 2020. And then I just recently had my son um, in March of this year. So he's four months old now. And um, one of the cutest pictures I have of him up in the top right. Yeah. And the last slide, I'll give a brief intro to what I do at my job. So the last, uh, like I mentioned, I'm in my second rotation. My first rotation was in printed wiring board producibility. Um, so that involved working with suppliers and design teams to make sure that the designs that the company was making were producible. So either we were um, working with these suppliers to kind of you know, develop processes with them to be able to build the things we wanted or we were working off their standard processes. Um, but you know, you're having to interface between suppliers and design teams, which really gives you the opportunity to interface with a lot of different programs within the company to see you know, what different products are being made and um, how that influences business decisions within the company. Um, the other thing that I liked about that role was it allowed me to uh, learn a lot of different skills and knowledge within the company. Um, I really enjoyed that position. And so moving into the advanced packaging group where I'm working with microelectronic packaging, um, you know, I mentioned in the producibility group, I'm working with design teams. Well, now I'm in that design team. I'm working with the producibility group from the other side to, you know, work on these designs um, of these different electronic packages that are being products for the company. So, um, you know, working with producibility, I'm hoping that my last rotation will kind of lead into the experience I need to help inform design decisions in my current role. Um, and so it's just nice seeing a different perspective of the same design process within the company. So that was kind of why I moved over there. And so far I'm enjoying it, but I just started um, back in June when I returned from maternity leave. So. See if you have any questions for me in the chat. No, oh baby, yeah, he's so cute. <laughs> we can go back to slide two if you guys wanna look at him. Here <laughs> we go. That is a cute kid. <laughs> Very he is so cute. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your journey. This is all very interesting. And I did not realize you were a cheerleader, too. That's so cool. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's not something that a lot of people, they'll be like, you're a cheerleader and an engineer. I'm like, yeah, you wouldn't expect that. But, you know, anybody can be what they want to be. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it's not the most common combination, I feel. That's really cool. Um, so I think we are going to have our question, table our questions for after both the presentations. So okay, thank great. you, Andrea. I think we're going to move, so we're going to move on to James now. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen so James can pull his slides up. Um, my co-host. Uh, let me allow. Okay. You should be able to share now. Mm -hmm. Can everyone see my screen? Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so yeah. chains. Yeah, yeah. Like to... Oh no, no, no! I don't want to do that. Uh, we can see your presentation mode. Yeah. Okay. Let's um, swap. So while James gets that ready, uh, a brief introduction of him. Uh, so James Carpenter is a graduate student here at the University of Illinois with Professor Nenad Milkovich's lab while we actually work in the same group. He received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, Washington University in St. Louis in 2015 and his master's in mechanical and science and engineering from UIUC in 2018. His research interests include sustainable energy solutions, thermal efficiency enhancements of engineering systems, and the application of nanoscale heat transfer concepts to achieve both those goals. Currently, his research focuses on ice bridge formation on super hydrophobic surfaces. And outside of his work, he also enjoys reading, exercise, and mindfulness practices. So with that, I think James is ready to show us uh, his journey. So uh, James, take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, Ariel, for that, that great introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so I'm going to start a little differently. I'm, I am going to lead with the end and then backfill chronologically. So this is me now, or actually this is me a few years ago. Um, but hi, I'm James. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is about two and a half hours away from Urbana-Champaign. Um, my, my favorite food is uh, gyros, which are, it's like a Mediterranean dish. It's very, very good. There's a good place in St. Louis. If anybody is interested in finding out or learning more about that, please ask. Um, and my major is mechanical engineering, as Ariel stated. And let's see, I think I'm in like 21st grade now. So um, <laughs> I've been in school for a long time. Um, and why did I choose mechanical engineering? It's because I've been a tinkerer all my life, mostly uh, taking lots of things apart, only putting maybe half of them back together. Um, but that's how you learn. Uh, so I've always been a tinker and and mechanic in mechanical engineering and lots of engineering you get to tink tinker a lot so um, I really like that and in terms of you know what I do um, as a as a graduate student at UIUC I've prepared some videos that that highlight um, uh, my research which basically focuses on um, examining uh, how fluids and surfaces interact and and how to change the behavior. Uh, that fluids exhibit on surfaces. So um, in this, this far left video, uh, what we have here, this is a droplet. It's about three millimeters in size. And um, the temperature of the droplet is actually 23 degrees Fahrenheit, which is nine degrees below uh, the standard freezing temperature of water. Uh, but it's a liquid. Uh, I can explain how you do that at a later time. And it's gonna fall in this sample that's at five degrees C, which is also much, much cooler uh, than the, the freezing temperature of water. But uh, nevertheless, uh, because of my research, we're able to maintain this liquid water droplet as a, um, as a liquid. So let's see. Um, and this is, this is, so this is one of the experiments I do, which is called droplet impact, trying to prevent freezing, water from freezing on engineered surfaces. Think airplane wings. Um, in the second uh, video, this, these are really small droplets, 100 micrometer droplets. Um, and as, as they coalesce, as they come together, they, they can jump away from the surface. So uh, this is really cool. And so I, I, I like showing this video. And in the last video, uh, we have a pretty big droplet uh, impacting a very cold surface, minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. And as we can see, uh, when that droplet impacts the surface, it doesn't freeze right away. The interface freezes and it starts doing this flubber type thing, uh, which I think is really cool. And people really like this. If you don't know what Flubber is, it's fine. It's a very old uh, movie, uh, but um, it's good. You should watch it, Robin Williams. OK, now that we have that out of the way, um, my STEM journey. Uh, so it started in 1990, so I'm a little older. And um, that's a, a baby picture I have. And I was, I was a pretty cute kid, I know. Um, and it starts in 1990. And essentially from 1990 to 2005, this is what I did. <laughs> I played video games, uh, Super Nintendos, Playstations, N64s. 
Oh, and I also played card games. So this is a uh, this is Yu Gi Oh. So this is Jinzo. Um, he he was my favorite card, and I actually won a tournament season playing Yu Gi Oh. And I was also I also played a lot of basketball. So uh, really, you know, when I was sitting down, you know, making this presentation, I was like, all right, what do I talk about? What do I talk about? And honestly, first fifteen years, it's essentially this. <laughs> it's essentially this. Um, and uh, like I said, I was always a tinkerer. Um, I, I wanted to be, a, as you can see, I wanted to be a video game designer. That's what I wanted to do um, during my formative adolescent years. Um, and, and yeah, and so that's, that's what I was pursuing, if you will. Or that's what I thought I wanted to do. Um, however, uh, after my freshman year of high school, I stopped going. Um, my high school wasn't, I grew up in the inner city. My high school wasn't very good. I uh, didn't really foster a safe and productive environment, learning environment, and also lack structure and accountability at home. So uh, after my freshman year, I didn't go to high school for an entire year. And um, my mom wanted me to go back uh, for my, for, I guess what would have been my junior year. And I did, I attempted to, um, but it was really hard, you know, wearing a, an ID that said 10th grade when you were supposed to be in 11th grade in an environment that already wasn't very a productive learning environment. So that didn't work out. Um, and uh, one of the guidance counselors suggested that I go to this place called Job Corps, uh, the St. Louis Job Corps to be specific. Um, and Job Corps, is, uh, it's a program that started uh, in 1964 with President uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty. So a lot of programs started in this during this time, the food stamp program, Job Corps, um, a few other programs. And the, the purpose of the initiative was to address uh, this country's high poverty rate, uh, which was 19% at the time. So um, in Job Corps, uh, it provides a free education and vocational training, uh, so a trade uh, to low-income at-risk youth. Uh, and that's, that's what I was. So at-risk means essentially at-risk for doing bad things or not becoming a productive member of society. Uh, so it's a highly structured environment. You get up 5, 5 a.m., you have set regimens. It's, it's very boot camp-like. Um, and essentially you go there, you, if you don't have your high school diploma, you get your GED and you complete a trade. And so um, I was in Job Corps for three years from when I was 16 and a half until about 19. Um, I, attain, I got my GED, which is uh, the high school equivalent, and I completed my vocational training. And um, let's see. So when you when you got into Job Corps, you took this test. This it's called the TABE test, but it's the test of adult basic education. So they're trying to see if you can read and write and count, essentially. And um, my test scores were pretty good. Uh, and as a result, I got put into this track to uh, go into the advanced career training program, which is the college program at Job Corps. Um, so Job Corps had about, St. Louis Job Corps had about 450 students. Um, and the entire time I was there, there may have been two people in the advanced career training program. Most of the time it was just me. Um, and this program allowed me to uh, take classes at the local community college and subsequently at the State University in St. Louis. Uh, and, and that's what I did. Uh, so here's a, a little timeline of how that works. So in 2007, I got into Job Corps. I was 16. Job Corps accepts people from 16 to 24. So we, I was one of the young people there. Um, and by that summer, so January 23rd, 2007 is when I, I, I like to say enlisted into Job Corps. Um, and by uh, June 2007, I was at St. Louis Community College, but I only had a freshman high school uh, education. I was able to pass the GED, but I only had a freshman high school education. So uh, I had to start in what's known as elementary algebra. And I know everyone in here has probably passed that point, but it, the progression goes like this, elementary algebra, intermediate algebra, college algebra, trigonometry, then calculus one, right? So it's like three or four classes before that. And intro to college writing is the class right before college comp one. So I started a little bit behind, but I was a year ahead of what my 
graduation date would have been in high school. So uh, that year, I essentially caught up. And in 2008, I started in Calc 1, and Physics 1, and Chemistry 1 at the University of Missouri St. Louis. Um, and then two years after that, I, uh, I, I transitioned to Washington University in St. Louis for my, um, my upper division classes. Uh, and I went to Wash U for about a year. Um, and then my interest changed again uh, to playing poker from so and 20 from 2011 to 2013 I didn't go to Wash U. Um, I was on leave, if you will, and I played poker and worked at hotels as a banquet server and as a banquet houseman, the people that set up banquet events. Um, but that wasn't very intellectually fulfilling uh, over time and I didn't I didn't like playing poker in casinos because I didn't like cigarette smoke. So um, eventually I decided, okay, I, I need to go back to school and get a real job. So I would return to Wash U um, and uh, started retaking classes. I continued to work though, because I got used to having money um, and I couldn't go back to, to not having money. Uh, so I, I worked uh, while I attended uh, Wash University. Um, and towards the end, like, hmm, uh, two semesters before my two semesters from graduating, I took a thermal design course. It's like a second semester thermodynamics course. And the project that I had, which essentially revolved around combining all of these, um, these, these thermal systems uh, to, uh, to make an a, a efficient system for forward operating bases in the Middle East, an efficient um, electrical system, and efficient and sustainable electrical system. Uh, that was what my project was. And it was, it, I had to do a lot of research, me and my team, me and my group. And um, from doing all that research, I got really interested in doing research uh, and decided that, okay, I just go to, I wanna go to graduate school. Cause I also didn't want to, um, I didn't want to, my, my friends that were ahead of me had graduated and they they didn't like their industry jobs coming out of college either. So that was also a determining factor. Uh, and so I took the GED or, or GRE, did pretty well, applied to UIUC and came here as a mechanical engineering graduate student. Uh, so my takeaway messages uh, from, from my experience is one, don't be deterred by detractors, people that say that you can't do something um, it's and it's okay to not know what you want to do right now. I certainly didn't um, at various points throughout my journey. Um, everyone doesn't start their journey at the same place, and that's okay. Um, and finally, you can do anything you set your mind to. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, James. That was, I think we learned a lot from your journey as well. And all very inspiring too. Um, so do you know what you want to do now? I'm working on it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to be a professor. I want to be a professor. Mm -hmm. I'm, and I'm positive of that. Nice, nice. Okay. So um, yeah, thank you both for the great presentations. I think at this point, we can move on formally to our uh, Q&A portion of the panel. Um, so uh, we're going to be trying to be a little bit more structured about it just so we can group our questions um, into related parts. And I actually wanted to start out by talking about both of your current um, current work, your current career. So I know you both touched on, um, Andrew, you're in the rotational program working on electronics packaging, and you were looking at different perspectives that kind of informed the design process. Um, and then James, of course, we're in the same group and I know a little bit about your work, but um, uh, could you both go into a little bit more detail about what your responsibilities are like and what your work is like on the day to day and how you divide your time? You know? I guess I could go, uh, yeah, I guess I can go first. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I'll be as specific as I can without releasing any proprietary information, but um, so I will say that with COVID, 
um, my company basically mandated if you can work from home, you work from home. And until recently, that's been kind of lifted with the mask mandates and stuff in Baltimore being lifted. They kind of are being a little bit more relaxed about that, but are still allowing people to work from home. So currently with my four month old child, um, I'm keeping it safe and I'm still staying at home, um, which is why you guys can see my ceiling fan in the background. Um, <laughs> but day to day, um, you know, I'm, I'm at home. So I'm working from the computer, um, but I'm, I'm having to answer emails. Usually I have two to three meetings per day over Skype. And then anytime outside of that, I might be, and those meetings are like, um, we call them program meetings. So it's where we update um, you know, the, the people above us as to what we're doing. You know, do we have any issues that we can't resolve? Is there something that we're waiting on that, you know, maybe this person isn't moving quickly enough or maybe they don't have enough direction to be able to do what they need to do and that, that impacts what I need to do. Um, so it's our way of getting together and saying, well, I'm waiting on this or that or, you know, I'm having this challenge. I don't know how to approach it. Um, does anybody have any suggestions? Or just giving a brief update. You know, I'm working on this. Um, I haven't quite made it. You know, to the to the to the end point yet. But um, you know, maybe a few more days and I'll be there, or another week. You know, just kind of giving an update. Outside of that, I'm um, working designs in AutoCAD, um, doing 3D modeling and our 3D modeling software. Um, I may be sending emails to manufacturing. Um, we've got a manufa manufacturing plant at my facility. So, you know, the things that we're being designed, they also have to be built. So I'm having these conversations with producibility, having conversations with manufacturing, materials, thermal engineers, um, basically just running my ideas by them. You know, if we do this, what are the you know pros or cons? What are the advantages, disadvantages, and kind of making these trades, having conversations with people and um, trying to inform, you know, the decisions that I'm making and being able to go back to those program meetings and say, these are the decisions that I've made. Here's the reason why I've made them or saying, these are our options. What do you guys think? You know, because usually, you know, they're there's either one of two ways it goes either there's a there's a clear cut decision like yeah this is the preferred option or you know maybe there is a, a significant trade there you know maybe the pros of one option are great but there's also great cons there too so um, just having those conversations and um, really working together as a team is a lot of a lot of my job i interact with a lot of different types of disciplines and not necessarily engineers always Thank you, thank you. And what about you, James? Oh, you're on mute. I'm I'm sorry. I haven't. I've I've been in person recently, and I haven't been in class recently, so I haven't been on Zoom recently as much. Um, what does a day look like for me? Well, um, it generally involves me getting to work around nine nine thirty. Um, like being in the office, uh, not today because uh, I had things to do this morning, but um, generally I get there about 9, 930 um, and I leave around five. Uh, my day generally starts with me doing some type of um, getting some type of experiment running. Um, I have multiple projects uh, earlier. You saw some of the droplets, you know, bouncing on the surface. That's just one of my projects. I have about three that I juggle. Um, and I have two undergraduates that I mentor. So they they tend to come in um, in the afternoon. So most mornings, um, I am getting um, the experiments ready or the the um, the process uh, down that they're going to run in the afternoon. Uh, so that may involve me doing, you know, reading papers, uh, doing uh, literature reviews, things of that nature. Um, and then setting up the experiment, make sure, making sure the apparatus is, is working correctly. Uh, and then around lunchtime, I answer emails uh, because they, they tend to pile up and you gotta, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta, uh, you gotta, um, you gotta answer them frequently or somewhat frequently. I try to do two to three times a day. Um, and then after, after lunch, I tend to have my meetings uh, in the evening or in the afternoon because uh, everyone has to have meetings and I think it's best to have them towards the end of the day. 
Um, other than that, I meet with collaborators. I have a collaborator project uh, that um, that I'm writing a paper for right now. So meeting with him uh, quite often, my collaborator. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's about it. Uh, it's, I, I mostly do, I mostly get pre prepared to do experiments, do, pre do experiments or, or perform experiments, um, analyze the data um, and, and then make plots also, um, or presentations like in PowerPoint um, and software for graphing and whatnot. And then have meetings. Yeah. So that's it's fun, I promise. <laughs> I think uh, you both have a lot of meetings in common. <laughs> Having a lot of meetings, I mean. Um, so thank you for that. Um a little bit more of a a subjective take. What would you say is your fate are your favorite and least favorite parts about working in your current position? Okay, I guess I'll just keep going first to kind of keep things rolling. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good order, I guess. Um, okay, I would say my favorite part about my job is that I do get to interact with a lot of different types of um, engineers or um, like I work with a like, I don't want to say I work with them directly, but a lot of the engineering decisions that are being made our business decisions as well. So, um, you know, you always get that different perspective, you know, something that may work for you may not work for the electrical, something that may work for the thermal may not work for the mechanical. So just always having that constant like iterative process and feedback from everybody, I think it's really interesting to learn um, how everybody approaches a, a, a solution differently. Um, my least favorite part would probably be like, I work for a large company. So along with that, there's a lot of trickle down from the top of the company and I'm in our rotational program. So I'm like bottom of the totem pole. So there's a lot of trickle down that happens. Um, it's a lot of, I don't wanna say it's like, um, trying to use a positive word here. It's basically just like repeating the same information over and over again, emails that don't pertain to me um, or the same email multiple times. You know, it's just, a, it's a large company, a lot of, a lot of working, a lot of different things working together. So um, just trying to focus on what's, what is needed of me meeting my deliverables and not being distracted by all of the um, you know, like miscellaneous emails that I get from corporate or, um, you know, when software is down or when the network is acting funny, you know, it's just like you get these, maybe I probably get about 20 emails a day that I can just delete and I don't even need to look at them. So, um, and it's not something that I can just like forward to spam. Like I, they have to come to me. Um, it's protocol. So that's, um, that is one thing that is, you know, kind of um, distracting and um, I wish was different, but um, that's part of being in a large company and there's pros and cons there, so. James, you're on mute again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say that um, this is gonna sound very, I don't even know. Uh, what I really love about my job is that my job is essentially to learn, right? It's essentially to learn how something works, uh, you know, package it in, in, a, in a pretty way and then tell other people about it. And I like talking and I like learning. So these, these things go together. Um, so yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's really generic, but really I, I just sit around learning about things. And when I learn something new or, you know, when something clicks, it's, it's one of the best feelings that, yeah, that I, that I, that I experience. So I really like learning. And I get to do that in a job as a graduate student, probably more than my than any other job that I could ever I could think of. Um, to piggyback on um, Andrea's point, what I dislike most about it is is all the meetings and uh, <laughs> uh, the meetings and I, I'm I'm getting better with email. The the key is to you know not not become a slave to your email. Uh, but uh, the meetings, uh, a, lot, a lot of meetings I have where it's like, okay, there was maybe five minutes of this hour long meeting that, that I either pertain to me or is important to, you know, my life goals. 
And so you, you, I spend a decent amount of time every week sitting in meetings and not really being able to be productive uh, towards goals that I've set for myself. Um, and I wish I, I wish I had that time back. <laughs> um, but it's not so bad. It, but out of all the things, I like most things about my job. It, out of the things that I, I hate, that'd probably be the biggest one. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, I understand what you're saying with the emails and being part of large organizations certainly means that you have to work with a lot of people that you have to meet with and discuss things that aren't always relevant. Um, but I guess as a final question for uh, the career portion of this, um, since you both work in very different fields, are there resources that you're referred to to learn more about these career paths before you, um, you know, joined them and went on them? How can you learn about them essentially? I will say that going into grad school really broadened my horizon as to what was out there that I could do. You know, I was like dead set on going to NASA. Like I was just like, I'm going to work for NASA. But when I got into grad school, I realized that there's a lot of other companies that do very similar, very similar research or make products that are, you know, that kind of essentially do the same thing as NASA or maybe have a different take on it. So, um, you know, getting my job at Northrop Grumman, I actually, um, had a resource through, did you guys lose me? Can you still hear me? Okay, okay. Um, but I actually used a resource through the University of Arkansas that ended up um, connecting me with somebody at Northrop Grumman and then, you know, kind of went that way about it. But I do know that Poets has a lot of resources and if that avenue wouldn't have worked, um, Poets would have been my next place to kind of Put, put my foot in the door at their industry members and see if there was, you know, potential for me to, you know, get a job there. Uh, I will, uh, I got it right this time. Wonderful. Um, I will piggyback on what Andrea is saying. And I, and I will say that when it comes to, you know, resources for, for when I was applying to graduate school, uh, that came from professors that were interested in seeing me succeed. I would say. Um, I had a material science professor and undergraduate, uh, Professor Sastry. He was, he was, uh, he was, he was my best, I liked his class the most. Um, and he took an interest in me and, um, you know, su suggested resources for me. Well, well WashU has a, a very good, you know, career services department, or I guess, yeah, uh, arm or unit to their uh, career services. So, um, he direct or, or he got me in touch with them. They had tons of resources, flyers, uh, um, uh, timelines, things of that nature. How to prepare for the GRE. We had a lot of discussions with my with, with the career services at, at WashU, um, and yeah, they helped me decide on you know what schools to apply for, why to apply to them, things of that nature. He helped he helped me. Uh, 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 he explained to me, you know, what you should look for in an advisor, types of questions you should ask, things of that nature. And while I'm here, like while I've been here at UIUC, what I found to be most helpful and opening doors, uh, you know, for your for your professional development, your career advancement, um, would be being a part of uh, like research centers um, and 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 organizations on campus. So, for instance, Poets is a research center, and and they'll have uh, contacts with 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 industry partners, national labs, um, uh, other uh, institutions. If you're trying to pursue academia, I'm a part of another research center, the MERSEC, um, which is same way. Um, lots of professors and graduate students and even undergraduates working together, and a lot of them have contacts. So I would say, and this is you know you hear this a lot. I'm sure you've heard it 15 times already, but uh, your network. Um, building your network uh, it's very important because all, there are very few jobs that people get from code uh, I don't have any data but it seems to be that there are very few jobs that, that people get where they just go to a website and apply and someone calls them within a week um, it's more so uh, some a, men, a mentor of yours or someone you know 
uh, know someone who's working at a place that you're that you want to work and and you get put in contact with them and and then they can help streamline the process of the application and making sure your application gets in the right hands uh, because that that can be challenging also especially at large um, corporations so yes building your network um, is important you know once once you're looking for when you're looking for a job it's best to have your network built before then when you're applying to graduate school I would say contact professors um, they can um, they can they can put you on the, the right path to getting the information you need there Google's very helpful too oh well Jessica Spitt, seven out of ten people are hired not from uh, one of those Cold websites that applications yeah application websites 70 percent are hired from connections mm -hmm. and I got my job as a banquet server both of them you know in my interlude between starting my undergraduate and finishing it where there were both connection jobs thank you for that i think um that actually is the perfect transition into talking about really using the network and support system around you um so uh aside from all the people who kind of helped you figure out what you want to do with your careers um who were some role models that you had throughout your STEM career and how did they uh, kind of guide your decisions? And do you still keep in touch with them? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, okay, I will, so I wanna point out um, one person in particular. So like I had mentioned, I was pursuing my PhD in space and planetary sciences. There was a professor in that, it wasn't really a department at the University of Arkansas. It was more of like a, um, I don't wanna call it a group. It, it wasn't a formal department. There wasn't enough people in it to formalize it as a department, but it was still part of the grad school. And, but he was an, a mechanical engineering professor that you know kind of devoted some of his time to the space and planetary sciences. So I was working in the electrical engineering department, but I really looked up to him as a mentor his name is Larry Rowe, and he, you know, he was always there for me when it came to, you know, either just needing somebody to talk to when I didn't have ideas, when I need, when I needed that network and that connection, um, when I felt like, you know, maybe things weren't going the way that I wanted him to, and I, you know, I, he was one of the first people that I went to when I started considering not pursuing my PhD anymore and leaving with a master's. Um, and, you know, he kind of helped facilitate that conversation in my head of, you know, what is it that I really want? What are the pros and cons here? At the end of the day, you know, it's your decision to make and um, you're going to have to live by that. So I'm not going to tell you either way, you need to make that decision on your own. Um, so he really stood out and that was somebody that not necessarily reached out to me, but because I had, you know, just been around um, when we, you know, we had that mechanical engineering um, likeliness that you know we just he naturally became my mentor he wasn't ever my professor he wasn't my advisor i never did research with him it was none of that he just naturally kind of took on that um, mentor um you know that mentor for me and i do actually keep in touch with him um i don't go back to arkansas very often i live in baltimore maryland now um so that's pretty far away but I do email him often. I see how the program's doing and how he's doing. And um, when, when and if I do go back again, um, I'll probably meet up with him to have lunch or just see the labs and see how, how things are progressing with him and his, his research group. And uh, that person for me, the, the mentor figure would have to be um, a guy named uh, Jeffrey Taylor. So as I stated before, when I started Job Corps, I was 16, 16 and a half. Um, and uh, Jeffrey Taylor was the advanced career training coordinator. So uh, that's the ACT program. Um, that's the program that sends Job Corps students to college for free. So um, as a 16 year old, you know, from disadvantaged background, I didn't, I didn't know how to go to college. <laughs> I didn't know, you know, what um, what to do, you know, what the process was. Uh, he helped with 
um, um, applying for financial aid. Uh, he helped with uh, helping me decide which classes to take, um, help making sure that I, you know, um, he, he, he served as, you know, my accountability mentor, if you will, um, because I didn't have the best, um, let's, let's say, uh, good student skills, right? I was, I was just, I, I had a bit, I, my, 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 let's see, my formal education had been very limited, but you know, high school and high school, high school is very important. In high school, you learn a lot of things that you need, or you learn a lot of skills that are useful in college. And I, and I lack those skills. Um, and so Mr. Taylor was very important uh, and, and making sure that one, that I developed the skills and that I, and that I stayed focused. Um, and he helped with essentially all of the paperwork because I, I was, I didn't know, and I'm a first generation college student too. So I didn't have any, any, any support structure, familial at least, uh, for, for navigating college. And so he was, he was the person, uh, who, who helped me do that. Um, and yes, we, we do as a, as, as a matter of fact, yes, we do, um, communicate as a matter of fact, uh, a few months ago, he's, he's moved on from job Corps and he wanted, he wanted a recommendation letter from me, from me, uh, because for some provost job or something at some local school in St. Louis, uh, the community college. And, and I said, and I was, I was just stunned that, that I'm, I'm giving him a recommendation letter. Um, and yeah, so yes, we do keep in contact, probably speak several times a year. Um, and he's doing great. So I'm happy. That sounds great. It's great that you get both had some great people to guide you throughout your careers and bring you to where you are now. Um, I think we are nearing the end of our time. Um, so we might have time for just one last question. Uh, and I think to close it off, we covered a lot of um, what made you choose your majors and what activities you did outside of your career and outside of your schoolwork. So I think uh, a good way to end this might be to get some key takeaways again um, on reflecting on your past career. So. Uh, I guess if you were to give your high school or maybe your college selves a key piece of advice uh, to guide you to succeed, uh, what would that be? Okay, so I would say looking back on things now that it's okay to not know what you wanna do. It's okay to change your mind if you decide that you want to do something else. I think the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to make yourself happy and to do things that you love. So if you wake up every day hating your job, well, there's probably, a, you know, a, 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 it's probably a good time to change what you're doing. Um, and there's never a wrong time to change. You're not wrong for, you know, making the decision to do something and then deciding that you don't want to do that anymore. There's literally no way to see if you like something unless you try it. So biggest advice would be do what you love. Um, if there's something out there that you want to do, put your mind to it and you can do it. Um, and it's okay to change your mind if you decided then something that you don't want to do. And I wholeheartedly agree with with all of that. I will just add that you know, an issue that I had—I still have this issue, but at least I'm aware of it now, right? Um, is don't try to do everything. Uh, that's that 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 is. Um, I don't know if it's you know common amongst you know people to to have this this tendency to want to do and learn everything. I, I second think, that. <laughs> I think that um, in both undergrad, definitely in graduate school, try try to, you know, I think three is good. Three is a really good number. I don't know, you know, what about what about the number three it is, but I feel like, you know, identify you know three goals that you have, right, and and organ and organize structure your your you know your studies or your learning around you know uh, achieving those goals. Don't don't have like 
12 goals that you're trying to do at once. Just have a few and, and have it be more of a progression. Um, basically, the reason I state this because it can it can you don't want to overwhelm yourself. And and there's there's something called the, you can become paralyzed by choice. Uh, paralyzed by the number of goals you have, paralyzed by the number of responsibilities you have. So it's 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 important to stay grounded and to um, to identify things that are truly important to you, truly important, um, and then you know pursue those whole, wholeheartedly. So that's what I would tell my younger self, and that's what I'm telling myself every morning. So that's a that's a big one you've got to constantly remind yourself like no i have limits there are things i can do things that i can't do so let me make sure i i keep that focus because you want to help everybody all the time you want to do all the cool things but at some point you've got to you've got to decide what's best for you so i completely agree with that yeah that is definitely great insight that i'm still also learning every day all right, so uh, it is just about the end of our time. Thank you again so much, uh, James and Andrea, for coming to this panel. Uh, I think we all really appreciated hearing about your careers, how you got there, have some very interesting paths there. And I want to thank all of the attendees for coming uh, to our panel today. We will, we've recorded this session, so we will be able to upload this uh, at some point in the future if you want to refer back to this or show it to other people who you think uh, might find it interesting. Um, and so with that, yeah, thank you everybody and have a great day. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Thanks Jessica and Thanks. Ariel for organizing this. Thank you, goodbye. Thanks, Andrew, everybody. you were great. How you doing, Thanks, Zach? Thanks, you too, James. <laughs> <laughs> See you guys later, bye-bye.